Howdy folks, Lubos Breda from Particle & Cell Consulting here. And I wanted to give you a brief introduction to a book that I wrote in 2019 called Plasma Simulations by Example. So this book is published by CRC Press. It's an imprint of Taylor & Francis and you can buy the book wherever books are sold, be it Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or even the publisher's own site called Rootledge. All right, so let me give you a little bit of a historical context. When I was doing my own PhD, I started a scientific computing and a computational plasma physics blog at particleandcell.com slash blog. And due to essentially the realization that although there are many excellent texts out there that cover the mathematics of computational plasma physics, you know, for example, you know, Birds on Langdon, you know, Bird's book on DSMC, and you know, many other books like this one by Jardin or this one by Tajima. These books tend to either have no examples, or if they do have examples, then they are written in a rather archaic Fortran 77. Now, I write plasma codes for a living, and in my own experience, such codes are written either in C++ or in at least a more modern object-oriented programming like Fortran 90. So, with the blog, I essentially wanted to introduce let's say upper level undergraduate students or maybe graduate students to the world of computational plasma physics while also offering them some examples they can they use as a sort of springboard for their own research. So that content then eventually turned into a series of online plasma simulation courses which are still run to this day. So you can actually go to particleandcell.com slash courses to learn more, to register. And then the material from the courses became the book. All right. So let's, uh, let's go to a book. Now, just one little aside is that there is a companion site at plasmasimulationsbyexample.com, which is where you will actually find all the codes that are uh, described here. All right, so chapter one is the introduction. So here, this is where we cover some basics like the velocity distribution function, and we also see that you know, there actually are multiple ways of modeling gas kinetics, so we can have particle methods or fluid methods. And here we also start developing plasma simulation based on the electrostatic particle and cell method that models a single electron located in a, uh, in a potential well. So this is analogous to taking a marble and dropping it into a, into a bowl and then just seeing the marble oscillate back and forth essentially forever if we assume that there are no frictional losses. Which is, so this is basically what we do, end up doing here. Now, in order to actually do this, we have to uh, learn some you know, C++ basics. We have to learn about variables and um, you know, memory, the data allocation, uh, you know, code structure, you know, writing to files. So some of these you know, fundamentals. We also have to learn how to take a smooth partial differential equation, the Poisson's equation, and rewrite it into a discretized form that can be solved on a computer. So this is where we introduce the finite difference method. We also learn how to solve uh, the potential and then how to use the computed uh, potential to get the electric field by computing uh, the gradient. We also learn how to numeric advance the velocity and position. And we also see that for, a, for the simple setup we have here, we actually do not recover the expected analytical solution if we use a simple forward Euler algorithm. But if we use a a time center scheme called leapfrog than we do. All right, so that's, that's basically the end of chapter one. So in chapter two, we built on the concepts from chapter one by developing a three-dimensional electrostatic particle cell or ESP simulation. This is for a, a grounded box. So we start out by loading ions with uniform density in a three-dimensional box. And next, we load electrons but we load the electrons in only a single octant. So this results in the majority of the computational domain being charged non-neutral. So the electrons notice this and they basically try to neutralize the space charge and we end up with these interesting back and forth oscillations. Now, to do this, we have to cover even more C++. We have to learn about object-oriented programming, about templates, operator overloading, multidimensional arrays, a lot of stuff. So this is a pretty hefty chapter. Here we also learn about data visualization. Given that our code is written in C++, we do not have any built-in plotting capabilities. But instead, we write our results to a file in a format compatible with the open source visualization package called Paraview. 
So we also learn how to use Paraview, how to use filters and animation options to get these you know, nice, nice graphics. This now next brings me to chapter three. So in chapter three, we take the code from chapter two and we make some changes to it. The first change is that we introduce a SAL sphere into the computational domain. Now, given that our code is using a uniform Cartesian grid, we are somewhat limited with how we can actually represent internal objects. Essentially, all we can do is to flag the cells that are located inside of the sphere as internal. The downside of this is that it will lead to the smooth sphere turning into this sugar cubed or degenerate staircase representation. Now, another change we make is that now instead of simulating electrons as particles, as was the case before, we will now use a simple fluid model called the Boltzmann relationship to represent the electrons. The reason we want to do this is that many plasma simulations are actually more concerned with the dynamics of the heavy species, of the ions and the neutrals, and the electrons are there sort of just to provide like a, like a neutralizing background. And by not modeling the kinetics of the electron particles directly, we can actually have the simulation proceed using much larger time steps. So it will take many fewer iterations to simulate the same real time. Another change we make is that instead of loading particles at the start of the simulation, we begin with a vacuum case and we continuously inject the ions from the upstream boundary. So this will lead to the simulation first going to a transient state and then reaching a steady state. And so we also learn how to use averaging during steady state to compute uh, smooth, to basically to reduce the noise that is inherent in uh, kinetic particle simulations. We also learn how to uh, obtain some additional uh, macroscopic properties like uh, mean velocity and temperature from the particle data. By introducing the Boltzmann relationship for the electrons, our potential solver becomes nonlinear. So we learn how to use the newton raphson method to solve the, uh, this kind of a problem. And we also learn about a quasi-neutral approximation that can be used in some cases to obtain potential in a much faster way, but with some important loss of fidelity. All right, so next in chapter four, we introduce neutrals. So in chapter three, we assume that when an ion hit the sphere, it underwent surface neutralization. So it turned into a neutral. But we were actually not modeling neutrals. So we just deleted the particle from the domain. In chapter four, we actually simulate the neutrals. So we start out by learning how to model the diffuse reflection off the surface. And next, we learn how to couple the ion and neutral dynamics by, by simulating collisions. So that there are actually two commonly utilized algorithms for collisions. One is called Monte Carlo collisions or MCC, and the other one is called direct simulation Monte Carlo or DSMC, which is the, the topic of that book by Bird that I showed earlier, this one. Right? So we essentially implement the, the no time counter method from this book. We also see that by injecting a sufficiently high density of neutrals, we can actually uh, form a bow shock around the sphere. Now, there are some additional things that we cover here. We also briefly discuss about modeling sputtering and also the steps that one would take to simulate uh, flow of plasma around more complex objects, uh, objects that are represented using surface meshes. So this now brings me to chapter five. In chapter five, we learn how to utilize symmetry and reduce dimensionality to reduce the overall computational time. So for example, in this case of a flow around a sphere, we can notice that we can actually cut our domain into four quadrants, and the simulation is expected to be identical in all of them. So instead of modeling this full setup, we can just model just one quarter of it. So this will reduce the overall complexity and the runtime of the simulation. Now, if instead of a uh, sphere, we had a very long cylinder, we could now actually cut the domain along any location, along the cylinder, and we would expect the results to be identical. So this will give us a 2D planar XY configuration. So we'll learn how to write a code like this. Now, probably more useful or more practical is of planar codes are axisymmetric or RZ codes. So this is what you get if you are you know, looking into a cylinder and you assume that there is no variation of properties with the azimuthal theta direction. This is something that maybe might be encountered in the field of uh, plasma propulsion, for example. 
And so you learn how to modify the 2D planar code, how to modify the plasma potential solver inside of it, and how to modify the particle pushing algorithm to simulate this axisymmetric uh, configuration. So this next brings me to chapter six. The first five chapters all use the uniform Cartesian grid. And we already saw that by using a grid like that, we end up turning a smooth sphere into a degenerate sugar-cubed representation. If you actually wanted to resolve the smooth boundaries, you would have to utilize a different meshing strategy. Specifically, you would have to use an unstructured mesh. So here we learn how to actually generate a mesh like that. So we learn how to use a common off-the-shelf program to generate a tetrahedral mesh for a flow around the sphere. And next, we learn how to load a mesh like that into the, into the simulation program, and then how to push particles on a mesh like this. So the challenge here is going to be in, 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 finding up, uh, in coming up with an algorithm that can efficiently locate the cell that a particle is located in, and can then interpolate data between a particle and the mesh. Now once we do all, do all this, this is when the real fun begins. And the real fun is in implementing a finite element solver for the Poisson's equation. This is where we use this book by Hughes to, uh, to do this. And so once we have the, uh, the solver, we combine it with the particle pusher and we end up with a finite element or FEM flow around the sphere simulation code. So next we get to chapter seven. The first six chapters all assume electrostatics. So this is where we make the assumption that the magnetic field is time invariant so that the electric field can be computed in terms of a scalar potential. This is no longer going to be true once the plasma is dense enough so the current density within it is sufficiently high to induce a magnetic field. This is something that we might, for example, encounter in fusion applications. So we start this chapter by learning about magnetostatics, which is the opposite of electrostatics, which allows us to compute the magnetic field for a vacuum case. So for example, uh, for a magnetized sphere. Now, once we have this, once we have the initial field, we next learn how to use the uh, uh, Maxwell's equations, the Faraday's law and the Ampere's law, to time march the electric field and the magnetic field. Uh, we use this using a staggered or a Yi grid in which the magnetic field mesh is located at the cell centers of the electric field mesh. Uh, here we also have to learn how to compute curl and divergence of a vector quantity and then we basically put everything together and we write some little simple demo for, a, for this algorithm for this uh, electromagnetic particle and cell code. Next we get to chapter 8. So the first seven chapters, whether they use Cartesian or unstructured grid, they use electrostatics or, or EM implementation, all used the particle cell method, in which we used simulation particles to represent samples of the velocity distribution function of the ions, neutrals, or electrons. This is something that is uh, important to do whenever the plasma density is low enough, so you cannot make any assumptions about the shape of the VDF, where well, you need to compute the VDF cell consistently. But if the plasma density is high enough, then you can actually assume that because of collisions, the, uh, the, the particle populations follow the Maxwellian distribution function. In which case, you can use a mesh-based or fluid-based approach called magnetohydrodynamics or MHD. MHD is the CFD variant, but for plasmas. So in this chapter, we learn some basics. We don't go into too much detail, but we just cover some of the fundamentals of MHD. Let's cover some stability issues. And, you know, we basically put together a little demo program to uh, illustrate how, how this uh, method works. We also introduce a, another method called Vlasov method. So Vlasov method or Vlasov solvers are this interesting hybrid between MHD and PIC in that we again use a mesh to solve a partial differential equation. But this PDE is not for a conservation of macroscopic properties like density or velocity or temperature, but it's for the velocity distribution function itself. So by solving this PDE, we can actually self-consistently resolve the VDF in a manner analogous to PIC, but without the noise inherent in particle simulations. Now the big downside of LASA methods is that they are extremely computationally expensive, especially for high dimensional problems. 
So here we are limited to just a 1D, 1V example, and we illustrate how this method would be used to simulate the uh, two stream instability um, problem. And that, that brings me to chapter 9, the final chapter of plasma simulations by example. So the first eight chapters all utilized serial processing. This is where only a single instruction was being executed at a time. This is great for small programs, but as the uh, complexity grows, you will find that the program just taking way too long to run uh, comfortably on a, your local laptop or local workstation. Additionally, your program may require so much memory that it just doesn't fit into the RAM of a single system. So this is where you might start looking into some alternatives. So we begin by first learning about optimization and profiling to determine which parts of your code take the longest and then you know, we'll cover some basic, some common tricks for maybe reducing some memory access patterns to get the, uh, um, get the code to run a little bit faster. Next we introduce multi-threading. All modern CPUs contain multiple computational cores. So we learn how to use the thread library from C++ to write code that can essentially split itself into several different blocks that are running in parallel. And we use this to implement a multi-threaded version of the uh, flow around the sphere example. Next, we learn about the use of message passing interface or MPI to write code that runs on clusters or supercomputers or cloud computing these days. So with MPI, we essentially launch multiple copies of the program, but each copy knows that there are so many total programs running, and it also knows its own index or, or rank. And you can then use this information to figure out on its own which part of the problem it should be working on. And then it uses these MPI function calls to transfer data, uh, let's say, between neighbors. So for example, when particles end up crossing the domain boundary into a the neighbor domain, we end up packing all those particles into a buffer, and then we just transmit them all using an MPI send command to the neighbor. Now MPI is just one option for paralyzing codes. We can also take advantage of graphics cards or GPUs. So GPUs are essentially the vector computers of the early days of computing of the, the Cray of the or, you know from the 1960s or 70s, but it's a much small, much smaller footprint. So GPUs are optimized for single instruction, multiple data or SIMT uh, operations, where we do the same mathematics, the same calculation, just using different data. So for example, when we're pushing particles, we're applying the same integration of the equation of motion, we just have a different velocity as the sort of the forcing field in here. So this example is something that will be perfectly suited for a GPU uh, uh, parallelization. Now, programming GPUs is actually quite simple, especially the NVIDIA kind, because there is a C++ language extension called CUDA, that allows you to write functions that, when compiled, they do not run on the CPU, but they run on the GPU. Um, the other thing we do in this chapter, you know, besides developing this MPI version of the Florana Sphere and the, the CUDA version, is we also learn, learn about some common pitfalls. So, for example, in the case of multi-threading, it is imperative that we pay attention to the race condition. This is what happens when multiple threads try to write to the same memory location. So this leads to some non-deterministic behavior. In the case of MPI, we need to be careful about deadlock. This is what happens when multiple processes are sending data to each other, but there is nobody receiving. And then finally, in the case of CUDA, the, while the computation on the GPU is very fast, the data transfer between the CPU memory and the GPU memory can be actually quite time consuming. It can actually take so long that you can totally negate the uh, benefit of the faster computation. So here we also learn how to, uh, how to utilize streams to parallelize data transfer and uh, computation on the GPU. All right, so that's it. So that's the content of Plasma Simulations by example. So go ahead and buy yourself a copy. And when you do that, please leave a review at whatever site you used to buy the book from. Otherwise, if you have any questions, just send me an email. You'll find my information in the book and also on my site. Also, take a look at particleincell.com slash courses for the online courses I've been, that I offer every summer. Maybe I'll see some of you there. Otherwise, good luck with your research and see you around. Bye.